Okay, King Lear, Act Three, Scene Four. Let's do this. Um, so remember that Kent is taking Lear to a hovel, and he is going to put him there, and then go talk to the uh, daughters, Regan and Goneril, and see if he can come back inside. So we're here. So Kent goes, here's the place, my lord. Good, my lord. Enter the tyranny of the open nights too rough for nature to endure and still storm everywhere. Worst storm we've ever seen. Let me alone. Good, my lord. Enter here. Will break my heart? I had rather break mine own. Good, my lord. Enter. Thou thinkest tis much that this contentious storm invades us to the skin. Now, I don't know if you've noticed... But Lear, in these lines, is not making much sense. The storm has got to him. He's starting to go mad. So tis to thee, but where the greater malady is fixed, the lesser is scarce felt. Thou shut a bear, but if thy flight lay toward the roaring sea, thou dost meet the bear in the mouth when the mind's free. The body's delicate. This tempest in my mind doth from my senses take all feeling else save what beats there. So he talks to us. Not only is there a storm outside, there's a storm inside his mind. So super symbolic. Filial ingratitude. Is it not as this mouth should tend to tear this hand for lifting food to it? But I will punish home. No, I will weep no more. In such a night to shut me out, pour on, I will endure. Oh, in such a night as this, oh, Regan, Goneril, your old kind father whose frank heart gave all. Oh, that way madness lies. Let me shun that. No more of that. So he starts to think about Regan and Goneril. And then he says, no, if I think about them, it's going to make me even crazier than I already am. Good, my Lord, enter here. Pre thee, go in thyself. Seek thine own ease. This tempest will not leave me. Give me leave to ponder on things would hurt me more. But I'll go in. In, boy, you go. Oh, in boy, go first, you houseless poverty. He's talking to the fool. Nay, get thee in, I'll pray, and then I'll sleep. So the fool exits. He goes into the hovel. Poor naked wretches, wherever, wheresoever you are, that by the pelting of this pitiless storm, how shall your houseless heads and unfed sighs, your looped and windowed raggedness defend you? From seasons such as these, oh, I have taken too little care of this. Take physic pomp. Expose thyself to feel what wretches feel that thou mayest shake the superflux to them and show the heavens more just. He's starting to feel bad for the homeless and he sees the homeless in the fool. Now, Edgar, we don't know this, but Edgar is inside the hovel already and he screams out, Fathom and half, fathom and half, poor Tom. So the fool comes crawling out. Come not in there, Nuncle. Here's a spirit. Help me, help me. Kent, give me thy hand. Who's there? A spirit, a spirit. He says his name's poor Tom. What art thou that dost grumble in there in the straw? Come forth. So then Edgar enters and he's in disguise. Remember, he's disguised as poor Tom. So he's taking his clothes off. He looks like a beggar. Away, the foul fiend follows me. Through the sharp hawthorn blows the cold wind. Hum, go to thy cold bed and warm thee. Didst thou give all to thy daughters and art thou come to this? So we're going to highlight that one in green because Lear now is seeing poor Tom, Edgar, and is uh, freaking out that the reason Edgar is like this is because he gave his daughters everything. Who gives anything to poor Tom? Who the foul fiend hath led through fire and through flame? That's a song. Through the fires and the flames. Ah, Dragon Force. Where are my Dragon Force fans out there? Through ford and whirlpool, over bog and quagmire, that hath laid knives under his pillow and halters in his pew, set ratsbane by his porridge, made him proud of heart to ride on the bay, trotting horse over four-inch bridges to course his own shadow for a traitor. Bless thy five wits. Tom's a cold. Oh, doody, 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 doody. Bless thee from whirlwinds, a star blasting and taking. Do poor Tom some charity, whom the foul fiend vexes. There could 
I have him now and there and there again and there. So I think that Edgar is doing a convincing job of being crazy. Has his daughters brought him to this past? It's like he's whispering. Has his daughters brought him to this past? Couldst thou save nothing? Wouldst thou give them all? Nay, he reserved. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the fool. Huh? Nay, he reserved a blanket, else we all had been shamed. Now all the plague that in this pendulous airs hang faded or men's faults light on their daughters. So we're going to highlight that in green. We're actually going to go back and like highlight this in green as well. Because remember, Lear keeps putting this on the fact that he's daughters. And Ken says, he hath no daughters, sir. Death, traitor. Nothing could have subdued nature to such a lowliness but his unkind daughters. So he says the only way that poor Tom could be like this is if he had daughters and he gave them all and then he they, they took it away from him. Is it the fashion that discarded fathers should have thus little mercy on their flesh? Judicious punishment. Twas this flesh begot those pelican daughters. Pillicock sat on Pillicock Hill. Hello, hello, Lulu. This cold night will turn all of turn us all to fools and madmen. So you can just imagine this scene, right? We have Lear that's acting crazy because of the storm. We have Edgar that's acting crazy. And between them are the fool and Kent. And they're like, what the heck is going on? And the fool who's supposed to act crazy is the one that's making the most sense. Take heed, O the foul fiend, obey thy parents, keep the words justice, swear not, commit not with man's sworn spouse, set not thy sweet heart on proud array. Tom's a cold! What hast thou been? A serving man, proud in heart and mind, that curled my hair, wore gloves in my cap, served the lust of my mistress's heart, and did act of darkness with her, swore as many oaths as I spake words and broke them in the sweet face of heaven, one that slept in the contriving of lust and wake to do it. Wine loved I deeply, diced dearly, and in woman out paramoured the Turk. Faults of heart, light of ear, bloody of hand, hog and sloth, fox and stealth, wolf and greediness, dog and madness, lion and prey. Let not the creaking of shoes nor the rustling of silks betray thy poor heart to woman. Keep thy foot out of brothels, thy hand out of plackets, and thy pen from lender's book, and defy the foul fiend. Still through the hawthorn blows the cold wind, say some money. Dolphin, my boy, boy, Sessa, let him trot by. The storm is all over the place. So he's making up this story like, I did all these bad things. I drank and I gambled and I borrowed money that I shouldn't have and I cheated on my wife and now here I am. I'm all crazy. Thou wert better in a grave than to answer with thy uncovered body this extremity of the skies. Is man no more than this? Consider him well. Thou is the worm, no silk, the beast, no hide, the sheep, no wool, the cat, no perfume. Ha! There's three on it are sophisticated. Thou art the thing itself. Unaccustomed, unaccommodated man is no more but such a poor, bare, forked animal as thou art. Off, off, you lendings. Come unbutton here. And he starts tearing off his clothes. So we're going to highlight in green all this stuff. And uh, this as well. And he's tearing off his clothes. So now... We have half naked Edgar and we have fully naked Lear. And this is interesting part of Lear because Lear is an interesting part to play. You have to be a certain age. And there's you know men that are Shakespearean actors. They do, you know, Romeo in their early career. They maybe do Hamlet. They do uh, Macbeth as they get a little older. You can't do Lear though until you're extreme in age like we're talking 65 70 75 and then it's a very physical part you have this old man that's dancing around naked on the stage and i've seen productions where the the person playing Lear is actually naked and then there's ones where he just takes his shirt off and runs around in his pants but it's a very physical part but you have to be super old so there's that dichotomy 
Pre thee, Nuncle, be contented. Tis a naughty night to swim in. Now a little fire in a wild field were like an old lecher's heart, a small spark, all the rest on body cold. So the fool says, whoa, don't get naked, come on. So here comes Gloucester with the torch. Look, here comes a walking fire. This is the foul fiend, flip it to jibbit. He begins at curfew and walks till the first cock. He gives the web and a pin, squints the eye, and makes the hair lip mildews and white wheat, and hurts the poor creature of earth. Swinehold footed thrice the old. He met the nightmare and her ninefold, bid her light and her trough plight, and a right thee, witch, a right thee. So Gloucester comes into all this madness. Ken says, How fares your grace? Lear says, What's he? Who's there? What is it you seek? What are your names? Your names. Poor Tom that eats the swimming frog, the toad, the tadpole, the wall newt, and the water that in the fury of his heart when the foul fiend ranges eats cow dung for salad, sallows, swallows the old rat and ditch dog, drinks the green mantle of the standing pool who is whipped from tithing to tithing and stopped, punished, and imprisoned, who hath had three suits to his back, six shirts to his body, horse to ride and weapon to wear, but mats and rice are much small deer, have been Tom's food for seven year long. Beware, my follower, peace, mulkin, peace, thou fiend. So Gloucester comes into all this. He turns to uh, Lear and says, what hath your grace no better company? I love that line because he's like, who are you hanging out with? So the Prince of Darkness is a gentleman, Mordu he's called, and Mahu. Our flesh and blood, my lord, is grown so vile that it doth hate that it gets. Poor Tom's a cold. Go in with me. My duty cannot suffer to obey in all your daughter's hard commands, though their injunction be to bar my doors and let this tyrannous knight take hold upon you. Yet have I ventured to come seek you out and bring you where both fire and food is ready. So he says, come with me. Come to my house. I figured out a way to get you inside, even though it's treason. First, let me talk with this philosopher. So he points to Edgar. I want to talk with this philosopher. What is the cause of thunder? Good, my lord, take his offer. Go into the house. I'll take a word with the same learned Theban. What is your study? How to prevent the fiend and to kill vermin. Let me ask you one word in private. So then they go off. The two crazy guys go off by themselves. They talk aside, right? And Kent goes to Gloucester. Importune him once more to go, my lord. His wits begin to unsettle. Canst thou blame him? <laughs> Storm all over. Yeah, canst thou blame him? Of course he's going crazy. His daughters seek his death. Ah, that good Kent. He said it would be thus, poor banished man. Thou sayest the king grows mad. I'll tell thee, friend. He doesn't recognize uh, Kent. It's total dramatic irony. I am almost mad myself. I had a son now outlawed for my blood. He sought my life, but lately, very late, I loved him, friend. No father, his son dearer. True to tell thee, the grief hath crazed my wit. What's a knight? What a knight's this? I do beseech your grace. So not only do we have dramatic irony with the fact that he's talking about Kent to Kent and doesn't recognize him, but also that he's talking about his son Edgar when Edgar is there, right? We know those things, but he, Gloucester, does not. Oh, cry you mercy, sir, noble philosopher, your company. Time's a cold. And fellow there, into the hovel, keep thee warm. Come, let's all in. This way, my lord, with him, I'll keep still with my philosopher. He's like, I want this guy. Good, my lord, soothe him. Let him take the fellow. Fine. Edgar can come too, or to poor Tom. Take him on you? Sirrah, come on, I'll go along with us. Come, good Athenian. No words, no words. Hush. Child Roland to the dark tower came. His word was still, fight. Oh, I'm sorry. This is, this is uh, Edgar. Child Roland to the dark tower came. His word was still fie fo fum. I smell the blood of an Englishman. Now, once again, we have like a literary shout out. 
So this child roll into the dark tower came is an allusion to the Robert Browning poem. But this line also was picked up by Stephen King for his Dark Tower uh, um, series of books. And that's how it starts. Child Roland to the Dark Tower came. And his main character is Roland. And so he wrote this whole series of books off of that one line from a Robert Browning poem. All right. So that is scene four. Pretty fun, right? Pretty good. So I will see you next time. We'll read some more Lear. Bye.